My name is Michael Preston. I'm the Executive Director of the Florida Consortium of Metropolitan Research Universities. Thank you for joining us today for the official kickoff of our Year of Reflection, a collaborative initiative focused on racism and bias. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with us, the Florida Consortium is a collaborative partnership between Florida International University, the University of Central Florida, and the University of South Florida. Together, we pool our expertise and are focused on student success. Ultimately, we work together to produce career-ready university graduates. 48% of students attending a public university in Florida hail from FIU, UCF, and USF. 57% of undergraduate minority students are Panthers, Knights, or Bulls. Since our inception in 2015, FIU, UCF, and USF have made tremendous progress to improve graduation rates. In 2019, Florida Consortium Institutions awarded over 36,000 degrees. Together, we are responsible for tremendous economic impact in the Sunshine State. 76% of our learners continue to live and work in Florida long after graduation. So, as you can see, student success through collaboration is at the heart of our work. This past summer, the Florida Consortium and Helios Education Foundation teamed up and awarded nearly $650,000 in emergency aid to students who otherwise would not have continued their studies. So now that you know a little bit more about the Florida Consortium, you may be wondering why we've decided to work together to address racism and stamp out bias. During this past summer, the Florida Consortium met President's Council met. The President's Council is made up of President Rosenberg and Provost Furton of FIU, and President Cartwright and Provost Johnson of UCF, and President Corral and Provost Wilcox of USF, as well as Paul J. Luna, President and CEO of Helios Education Foundation. You may recall our campus communities had quickly transitioned to remote learning. Individually, we were doing our best during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. We were also reeling from the social unrest due to the election season, as well as the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. The President's Council discussed and considered the short-term and long-term impact to our campus communities. With that in mind, and with the support of Helios Education Foundation, we decided to work together. We committed to providing spaces for discussion and understanding. Equally important, we can, uh, committed to co-developing a path to sustainable change. Today, you will hear, hear from Dr. Mark B. Rosenberg of Florida International University, Dr. Alexander Cartwright of the University of Central Florida, and Dr. Steve Corral of the University of South Florida. This discussion will be moderated by our friend and colleague, Mr. Paul J. Luna, Helios President and CEO. But before we get started, we want to acknowledge our Year of Reflection Steering Committee. Together, contributors from FIU, UCF, and USF have designed an outstanding Year of Reflection plan. And now, I'd like to introduce Mr. Paul J. Luna. Since 2006, he has served as President and CEO of Helios Education Foundation. In this role, Paul is responsible for guiding the strategic direction of Helios, cultivating strong community relationships, and initiating strategic partnerships in Arizona and Florida. Paul is a longstanding partner and friend of FIU, UCF, and USF. He has worked closely with our group since, the, since our inception as a collaborative partnership. Paul is a passionate and, and is a passionate advocate for students in Florida and Arizona. So without further ado, take it away, Paul. Thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to moderate this conversation and to further conversations regarding equity and inclusion. Helios Education Foundation believes that every student, regardless of background or what zip code with which they live, every student deserves a high quality education. Our fundamental beliefs of community, equity, investment, and partnership are the foundation upon which we do all of our work and it motivates us to support post-secondary completion for all students, particularly first-generation, low-income, 
and underrepresented students. I know that each of the universities represented here today also believe in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and in particular, in the potential of all students. So I'd like to kick off our conversation, and I would like to invite President Rosenberg to describe for the viewers what we mean by the year of reflection. Thank you, Paul. This year of reflection is a collaboration between like-minded urban higher education institutions in Florida, uh, Florida International University, University of Central Florida, and University of South Florida, FIU, UCF, and USF. We share a, a devotion to dialogue. We share a devotion to impact uh, in our communities and beyond. We are very committed to, to reducing equities and leveling the playing field. And through our respective efforts, each of our institutions brings to the table that shared passion on one hand, but on the other, we have unique perspectives that we're eager to share with each other and with our respective communities based on our student demographics, based on the communities we serve, and based on the research interests of our faculty. Each of our institutions is different. We have an awful lot in common, but there are differences that, that of course drive us, that drive our respective ecosystems. And our academic programs and our research uh, are customized uh, to meet the needs of the areas that we serve and to uh, enrich the capabilities and the talents of the individuals who are at our respective institutions. But in the end, what unites us is our, our goal to empower our stakeholders, empower Floridians, and to become informed and engaged and to promote and to encourage meaningful action. Indeed, since the creation of our Florida Consortium, uh, metropolitan research institutions, universities, uh, we've committed to tr transforming students' lives in an accelerated fashion and the metropolitan areas that we serve. So this year of reflection uh, and its specific focus definitely aligns uh, perfectly with our overarching goals and is intended to meet and exceed expectations in our respective communities for the critical issues that we're addressing. Thank you, President Rosenberg. So at this point, we'll transition to a video from FIU on their equity and inclusion efforts. At FIU, we are redoubling our efforts and reaffirming our commitment to equity and inclusion. We're doing it through the creation of our Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We pride ourselves on being a top 50 public university that excels at graduating minorities with bachelor's and master's degrees. What distinguishes our current efforts are our intentional and unapologetic steps to root out systemic racism and inequities. As we achieve the objectives associated with DEI priorities, we accelerate student success for every student. In the wake of George Floyd's death and other incidents of racial injustice, our university community came together to review all aspects of FIU through the anti-racism lens and make real changes. Our practices will be more equitable. Our sense of inclusion will accelerate progress on our strategic goals, especially in the areas of student success, which is already reflected in our high social mobility ranking. Our message to the university community is loud and clear. We hear you. We're committed to your success and well-being. You belong here. 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 You, yes, you belong here. You belong here. You belong here! You belong here. Like me, you belong at FIU. You belong at FIU! Thank you again, President Rosenberg. Uh, your insight is exactly what will keep the momentum going to our, through our year of reflection. So at this point, I'd like to bring in President Cartwright for our next segment. FIU, UCF, and USF have diverse campus communities, but that diversity is not always reflected in higher education. So President Cartwright, what areas or programs related to your campus do you anticipate will be involved with the year of reflection? Well, at UCF, uh, we're going to be uh, involving areas from around the entire institution. Uh, much of it will be driven, of course, by our 
Office of Diversity, Equity, uh, and Inclusion, but we'll also have uh, efforts led through our Student Development and Enrollment Services Division, specifically looking at uh, community development and how do we support uh, uh, our students. Um, for us to think about uh, the future for, uh, and to reflect on what we've done, uh, we need to really think about every aspect of what a university does. It's, it's, it's insufficient to just think maybe how this uh, impacts our students, but we need to be thinking about what are we doing for our staff? What are we doing for our, our, our faculty? And that means we're going to include people from HR, looking at uh, how do we hire uh, a, a diverse uh, group of uh, individuals that help us to become the incredible institution uh, that we want to be. I think metropolitan universities like the three of us have a distinct advantage in that we're in these wonderful communities where we really can leverage uh, all of our diversity and bring that to bear on the future of society. But you can only do that if you commit fully. And so we see it as being, you know, HR, we see it as being our diversity, equity and inclusion office and we see it certainly to be a student affairs uh, uh, group and in addition we see a big role uh, for the provost office and how we work through uh, with our with our faculty collectively that's actually what's going to allow us to look holistically at what we can be doing um, in this uh, in this time where we really should be thinking about how we can become better the more you can reflect on what you've done uh, and really do it in a way that you are honest about what you've been successful at and where you've had your challenges and how you can continue uh, to, to improve. I think that's, that's the way that we're gonna become uh, better institutions. And I'm, I'm proud to be uh, here with FIU and USF and, and having us all think about this uh, collaboratively. Thank you for those comments, President Cartwright. Your commitment to elevating opportunities for all students is evident, and it will only be enhanced during this year of reflection. So let's share a short video on campus-based activities that keep diversity, equity, and inclusion in the forefront at UCF. What we need to be is a model for inclusive excellence for the rest of the nation. To be a place that welcomes and supports people of every background, every creed, every color, every religion, every sexual orientation. Strength comes from our diversity. It makes us smarter. It makes us more compassionate and it makes us more human. When we embrace our diversity, we open the door to a world of infinite possibilities. The Latino community is one of the many assets that makes UCF great. We've created a really inclusive experience here on campus for students with intellectual disabilities. I'm Elise Mundelein. I'm a UCF Knight. I really just want to say that I see you all, you matter, and that you are welcome here. The Year of Reflection is an initiative that originated based on conversations amongst the four of us at a recent President's Council meeting. President Corral, how does this Year of Reflection fit with your vision and goals for USF? Well, Paul, um, uh, like our, our colleagues at uh, Florida International University and the University of Central Florida, we're deeply committed to um, having a positive impact on our regional community. Uh, we, we aspire to be a global research university, but we also have a more local impact on our region, the Tampa Bay region. And so uh, we, we do that in a number of ways. We, are, uh, we, we have uh, re rededicated financial resources to uh, research on um, uh, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism. And so we've allocated $500,000 to research by our faculty on um, 
how to better understand, and in fact, how to reflect more deeply through this research on how the university can continue to be a, a great advocate and champion for diversity and inclusion here in, in our region. And so um, we are also um, have a very aggressive Office of Supplier Diversity. So one of our roles as, as a large employer in the Tampa Bay region is that we have a lot of, of work that outside vendors do for us. And we've redoubled our commitment to ensuring that minority owned businesses have an opportunity to engage with the university and provide their services and be paid for that. And this is an important way that uh, we're helping to promote upward economic mobility and regional economic prosperity through helping those companies work with us in a commercial way in a way that also uh, helps them expand their, their business and create new high quality, high paying jobs for our region as well. So those are a couple of, of specific examples of initiatives that uh, we've taken to, to try to have a positive impact. Thank you, President Corral. A post-secondary degree is incredibly impactful, not only for the individual student, but for his and her family. And in this video, let's see how USF is promoting diversity in order to ensure that, most, that more students complete a post-secondary degree. The University of South Florida has received national recognition for eliminating the graduation gap. We're reinforcing our enduring commitment to diversity, inclusion, and equity with new investments in research to address anti-racism and by enhancing opportunities for black student success research shows is that any type of large-scale institutional transformation has to be supported at the leadership level and I think that what we've seen from uh, President Corral in particular is not just the commitment not just the rhetoric of anti-racism and diversity but resources dedicated to that. We are really a national leader in terms of student success and eliminating the gaps with retention and graduation but what we're also seeing is that this year gives us a chance to kind of step back and recalibrate things. We're really thinking through questions of access, achievement, inclusion, and engagement. I came to USF as a result of the diversity that I saw on campus. There is definitely some work to be done in terms of maintaining that diversity initiative. The project that we're working on now with anti-racism, it shows that there is a commitment here to improving the situation for black students and other students of color. What we're doing now is using what we've learned from the student success initiatives to develop a strong, robust Office of Faculty Success. In my department of civil and environmental engineering, there are three tenure-track faculty. I'm the first black woman tenured full professor in our college. And so I'm really proud of, of those things. I do think we need to look department by department and make sure that we are reflective of our population, make sure that our classrooms are reflective of our population, and make sure that the work we do is grounded in the communities around us. So we create this amazing pipeline of talent that we can recruit students who have family and you know a long history of living in the places around Tampa. So once again, thank you. Thank you, President Rosenberg, President Cartwright, President Corral, for your commitment to ongoing efforts to ensuring equity and opportunity are reflected on each of your campuses and for your commitment to the year of reflection. At this point, I'll turn the program back over to Dr. Michael Preston, Executive Director of the Florida Consortium. So as we think about the year of reflection, um, we certainly are excited about some of the ways that we're going to work together as uh, three institutions and, and think about diversity and inclusion on our college campuses. Um, I'd like to ask our, our presidents, what are some of the takeaways that you hope that our employees, our faculty, staff will um, have an opportunity to take away from this particular year? Um, perhaps uh, President Rosenberg, I'll start with you. Uh, yeah, I think that, um, you know, we, we have, certain myths that we, we live by. Uh, it, we, we are certainly very diverse at, at FIU and in Southeastern Florida and in the, in the 305 zip code, uh, but that uh, diversity doesn't necessarily lend itself automatically 
to uh, uh, opportunities that are uh, distributed uh, fairly uh, amongst uh, within our with our in our demographics, and um, we also uh, tend to have uh, biases that uh, we may not be aware of that are um, perhaps impeding uh, the the level playing field that we allegedly aspire to. So my hope will be that we are uh, focused uh, on understanding uh, how racism works uh, on one hand and on the other, that we are finding, having good conversations about ways to limit and reduce uh, or eliminate altogether uh, the bias that leads to, if you will, um, decisions that perhaps unintentionally, but nonetheless, uh, uh, result in exclusion for individuals who are qualified, who should be given equal and fair consideration with others. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, if you will, uh, greater awareness and consciousness raising. President Crown? Well, I, I hope that our, our, our employees, our faculty and our staff and our students have the opportunity this year to reflect on the complementary nature of diversity and inclusion. So when we talk about diversity, we're often um, referring to the composition, say the racial or gender composition of a student body or faculty or a leadership team, uh, which is very important that we have people from different backgrounds, different race, races, different perspectives, of course, um, and, and that's often a necessary but not sufficient condition for a, a truly welcoming environment and a, and a campus environment where people feel meaningful connectivity to the institution and to other people in the institution. And that comes more with uh, inclusion. So inclusion is, uh, represents, to my mind, more of a choice. It's a decision that people make to associate with each other uh, either in the workplace or, or socially. And so what we're trying to do is reduce barriers and promote ultimately inclusion where people are actually choosing or seeking out uh, individuals from different backgrounds, different perspectives in their social activities, in their uh, workplace collaborations. And so what, what we're really hoping is that there's a draw or a pull that um, our all of our university stakeholders feel to, to want to embrace people from different backgrounds and to, to choose them to spend time with socially and, and to get acquainted with uh, others' journeys, life journeys. And so the, the, the complementarity of diversity and inclusion is very important. And what we're really striving to do and aspire to do is to encourage uh, intentional inclusion among our faculty, staff, and our students. Great. Dr. Cartwright, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, you know, uh, President uh, Rosenberg and President Corral have done a, a great job of, of discussing, uh, you know, the, the importance of this and how we would want our, our faculty and staff to certainly reflect on everything that we're doing and, and become much more aware uh, of the challenges, the challenges of racism, of inequities and injustices that, that many people uh, face. Um, I think it's also an opportunity for us to, to think about um, raising that awareness and making people uh, more comfortable to have the difficult conversations that are needed. Because we really do need uh, to be able to talk about what people experience and, and how someone's experience is quite different uh, from another person uh, because of how they might look or, or, or where they're from. Um, that, that's that ability to be more comfortable in those conversations allow us to improve uh, as a society. Um, one of the things I'd love to see that comes out of this is that we end up having more of those open forum where we're talking about uh, difficult conversations and that the entire university is engaged in that 
uh, that type of conversation. We are already doing some of those things, but I think there's an opportunity for us to expand on those concepts and, and have everybody uh, in, engage much more uh, directly. I think the other thing too is an awareness, an awareness of what a remarkable opportunity we have. Um, if you look at, uh, there's a report, I think it was 2015 roughly by uh, McKinsey and uh, the title was Diversity Matters. And one of the things they point out in there is they looked at a number of different uh, companies, businesses, and, and they show that companies that are gender diverse are 15% more productive than companies that are not. They also show that companies that are diverse in every sense of the word are about 35% more productive. And that, that, that actually shows the, the connection to our lived experiences, our backgrounds, our diversity of thought, and how that can actually uh, drive us towards better solutions. And the more that we can embrace that, the more that our faculty, our, our staff, and everybody embraces that around what we're doing, which is educating the future of this country, uh, I think the better it's going to be for, for all of us. Paul, Luna, as a philanthropic organization, Helios Education Foundation certainly is a great partner um, of the Florida Consortium. But some folks might be asking, why uh, Helios? Uh, why are they interested in three universities talking about diversity and inclusion? And in your opening remarks, you mentioned a couple of items. But personally, how do, what, what, is, what are you hoping our institutions will really glean from this experience? Well, I, I would say from a Helios Education Foundation perspective, first and foremost, um, we just appreciate and value the opportunity to partner with such great institutions that, that are committed to serving the students, all students, which is what we care about as well. And, and to be willing to acknowledge and recognize that, uh, that we can all do better, that, that the real meaningful change that will come uh, in all of our commitment to give every student equal access and opportunity to succeed in post-secondary education. Um, for many first-generation college students like myself, and I know many of you, you know, this idea that, that we can become that first-generation college graduate and the implications and impact that that has, not just for the student, but for families and communities, you know, is really the spirit behind this. And, and I guess I would also add, you know, the why, it, it, it's leadership. You know, uh, meaningful dialogue and change that comes from embracing diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, requires space. It requires uh, faculty, staff, and students to truly feel that they are given the space to have these conversations, to share their perspective. And it requires leadership to be able to provide that space. And so to hear university presidents like we hear today uh, eloquently speaking on why diversity, equity, and inclusion is important to them and why they're committed to this. Uh, a willingness to reflect on where we've been, but, but more importantly, where we wanna go. Um, that's the leadership that is necessary to ensure that we are all truly embracing this idea that every student will be given an equal opportunity to be successful, to be successful on the unique campuses that they represent. But just as importantly, working together to establish best practices, to engage in, in meaningful dialogue across broader communities uh, which I think is, is what will role model what we want to see from all of our major community institutions in terms of serving uh, all of our residents and every student uh, in the manner that we want. Thank you. That's fantastic insight. And there was actually a report today, and, and, and so I want to briefly shift gears a little bit to access um, uh, for students, and especially when we're talking about diversity and inclusion when it comes to, to college access. The National Clearinghouse released some data that showed that those students in the lowest, um, that came from the lowest quartiles of the uh, socioeconomic standing, uh, were 29. Per, there was a 29 percent drop in enrollment this fall. So, and and they they think it's clearly connected to COVID-19 and the pandemic and access to higher education. As we start to get into uh, 2021 and start to think about the future in terms of recovery, how are our institutions thinking about reaching back out to students who might have felt higher education at this point in time was not inclusive of them because of their financial situation or, or maybe other situations in terms of, 
uh, whether or not they could even make it on campus or, or learn online. Um, I know it's a little bit of a, a curve balls, but um, you know, I'll, I'll start President Corral. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that as we start off? Well, <clears throat> we, we are um, aiming to be creative in the way that we reach out to students and convey a, a, a promise of a true community experience at the University of South Florida. And uh, we're thinking in fresh ways about that. So as, as we hopefully transition through uh, the challenges of COVID over the next year, we're, we're very committed to thinking about how to rebuild that residential community uh, experience that our students have on our, our campuses. And so uh, we're, we're trying to, to encourage folks to, at the appropriate time and, and, and safely, of course, to come into our residential facilities, our dormitories, and um, uh, resume some uh, adjusted and mitigated uh, form of, of, of the residential life uh, in our campus, in our dormitories, and, and also uh, on our campuses. Uh, and we're also thinking about um, how to advance the idea of the community experience digitally. So in addition to the in-residence uh, community experience that our students have, we're trying to be creative and innovative in thinking about uh, digital communities and how to connect people, uh, even though they are remote and um, uh, receiving instruction online, or even connecting in terms of student extracurricular activities um, through online uh, mechanisms. So we're, we're, we've got a two-pronged strategy there where we're trying to um, appropriately bolstered our commitment to res the residential experience uh, under, under safe and risk mitigation conditions, and yet also elevate our ability to, to uh, present an opportunity to be connected digitally. And, and uh, even though people are physically uh, distant, that there are ways for students to connect with each other and for faculty and students to connect and, uh, and with our staff as well. In some ways, the, the, the real cutting edge is, is how do we build community among students in a, in a digital format? Uh, we've, we've already made quite a lot of progress on instructional delivery through a digital format. So we're, we're getting better and better at that. But then how do we build that, that, that community and that connectedness that our students uh, feel with each other because we know that they learn a great deal from each other and a lot of the college experience is not just in the classroom it's outside the classroom as well so we're trying to be creative about how uh, we build around this idea of of community but we are aware that it has to be done both in residence and and in digital media and we last thing I'll, I'll just say to reinforce this concept of community is that uh, during autumn of 2019 and spring of 2020, the community went through a process of creating a, a shared list of principles of community. So that, that was a task force that I created that uh, was composed of faculty and staff and, and students. And so now we have this really great list of, of shared commitments we have about showing respect for each other, uh, listening to people with other perspectives, being evidence-based, uh, being transparent. So we have a set of principles about, about how we wish to engage with each other that, that can apply both in a residential setting and in a digital setting. So we're hoping that those principles of community will serve us in this transition time as we try to rebuild the residential community experience and also expand the, the digital community experience. Okay. That, that student engagement piece is so important, isn't it? And uh, when we start to think about, uh, Vincent Tinto talks about that a lot in student departure theory, and especially for those students with, uh, in a low SES, they, they typically um, connect and, and imprint on the institution. And that's, a, that's an important part of their growth and, and kind of really getting there on campus. Um, President Cartwright, um, in terms of access, I'm, how are y'all thinking about this, especially for these uh, communities that have been so impacted? You know, when you look at uh, UCF, and, and, and we're very similar, as uh, the other presidents have said, to FIU and, and to USF, um, 
we have a significant number of students who come here who are Pell eligible, who are first generation. Um, and we do a tremendous job of educating. When I say we, I mean all of us, uh, all three of these institutions do a tremendous job of providing opportunity and giving that access. There was a recent study done by Education Reform Now that listed UCF as number two in the country in terms of social mobility, the way that they actually uh, measured it. Um, and what was striking about that is that at UCF, we enroll more Pell eligible students than all the Ivies, MIT, Stanford, you throw in a bunch of other institutions and we're above all of them combined. Um, that's what we do. And I think we need to get that message out there because it, there, it, this is connected. The conversation around access is connected directly to diversity and inclusion and equity. And the way it's connected is that for you to be successful as an individual, you have to be able to see success. You have to look around and recognize that others are able to graduate. Others are able to be successful at the institution. When students come here and they're able to have that opportunity, they get to see that others are able to be successful. That there's a big benefit to that. And, and we should make sure we continue to tell that story about how committed we are uh, to, to providing access, but not only providing access, but providing access to being successful. Um, that's really important for our students and especially uh, Pell eligible and first uh, generation. Um, I would add to that also that if there are that many students who didn't opt to come to university or college this year, then we as a higher education community need to commit that we're going to reach out to all of those students and try to understand how we can get them to come next year or to come the year after. But the best thing we can do for society is educate and educate students so that they could be successful. You all know, I don't have, I don't have to tell you, but education transforms not the lives of the person that gets the degree, but it transforms the lives of people around them. It transforms the lives for generations. And so that's on us to figure out how we can bring those students back. I have great worries about the financial implications of COVID, the pandemic and the access that uh, it's going to limit for some people and anything we can do uh, to, to let people know that we're here for them, to let people know that these three institutions, I, I feel comfortable saying this from my colleagues, we are committed to that. And we're gonna make sure that anybody who comes here is successful. Um, so I, I think any student would do themselves great benefit to pick one of these three great institutions. That, that Pell investment is such an important part of the fabric of all three of our institutions. Uh, routinely, all three consortium institutions are in the top 10 in federal dollars spent in Pell eligibility. And the Federal Reserve actually re released a report in May that has recently gotten some traction that for every 1% increase in Pell spending within a metropolitan region, it results in a 2.4% increase in realized salaries in that region. It's a direct correlation and it's about the best money on a return on investment that the federal government can make in economic development, uh, which is uh, exciting news. Um, President Rosenberg, do you have any thoughts on, on the terms? Uh, you've been working in access for a long time. Right, I, 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 first of all, I want to endorse what, what my colleagues have said. Uh, and um, but let me let me let me come at it just a little bit differently. Just add another another perspective. Uh, when this when the COVID hit, uh, we as an institution made made the decision that that whatever happens, we want to come out better and stronger as a consequence. And and we were not going to curse the darkness of the circumstances. We we're going to try to figure them out and work with them. And one of the elements that was important in that conversation to Alex's point was making sure that we were maintaining the social mobility uh, of our base, which is very heavily Pell, undergraduate base, which is very heavily Pell, very heavily first generation. Now, clearly the DEI fits into that because we need to do a better job of, 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 of having demographics at the institution that represent 
uh, that audience and then speak immediately and directly to that audience. So I'd say the first thing is that we're going to try to, we definitely are going to do better on that. Uh, that's number one. Number two is there is a digital divide. And one of the reasons that uh, students have dropped out, uh, particularly low income students, is because since by and large the response has been digital uh, that we have had, uh, and, and since it's basically been tailored to uh, higher income students who already have access, who have bandwidth, who have devices, uh, we, I know each of our three institutions spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we could help those students who did not have working devices, who had very limited bandwidth to have that so they could continue their education. So that digital divide issue is very, very real. This, the, the, the third point I wanna make is, this is more, a little bit more philosophical, but also both uh, structural and existential. And that is we, uh, particularly as urban institutions, um, have to start becoming much more learner-centered and not, not just student-centered. All of our infrastructure is focused on students, traditional students, students who can attend for semesters, students who take four or five, six years to get their degrees. Guess what? A lot of those students who are, are not continuing need to work. They need the skills immediately and, and they can't afford to take three, four, five years to get the skills that are gonna put food on the table. So I think that we can be much more vital and uh, impactful uh, in that uh, domain. And then finally, to the spirit again of what, of what uh, Alex and um, um, uh, Steve have said, and that Helio stands for in many ways, is that we've got to do much more aggressive uh, efforts to meet students and learners where they are, not where we want them to be. And that starts in part with financing. We have to understand that the financial model that we are using doesn't work for everybody. And if we're truly committed to the diversity, and if we're truly committed to the inclusion and the access, we have to be much more thoughtful in how we uh, finance uh, our efforts, particularly as it relates to fees, particularly as it relates to tuition. And I think you're gonna see over the next five or six years, a very, very serious conversation nationally about that issue, particularly for public institutions that have a mobility as part of their efforts, even while they're ca carrying out their research and wanna be very solutions impact oriented in their communities. Thank you, President Rosenberg. And uh, Paul, uh, any thoughts as you hear the presidents talk about access? Yeah, I would love to, um, uh, Michael, thank you to speak, you know, first to, to the National Student Clearinghouse data that was recently released. And I have the pleasure of serving on the National College Access Network Board of Directors, NCAN, who partnered with the National Student Clearinghouse to release that data. Um, and, and I guess what I would suggest is that, especially for uh, our three leading institutions here and these universities that lead in serving students, that the data is showing from 2019 to 2020, that significant drop in student enrollment and post-secondary education. It's probably not data that surprises any of you or any of your um, uh, faculty and staff that are engaged in uh, serving the students that are most uh, at, at highest percentages, not finding their way, uh, likely with some direct impact to uh, the situation of COVID. So it's not the data that is as necessarily as shocking, at least not to, I'm sure, all of you and, and your faculty and staff, but it's, it's to the points that I think have been made by, by the university presidents, and that is really getting at the heart of why. Okay, why, why are students in low-income or coming from low-income communities or, or communities or, or schools that are defined as, as high poverty um, at a higher percentage not enrolling in college? And I think we have a lot of assumptions. We have a lot of understanding. But to really get at the innovative, um, and I know President Rosenberg was speaking to some of the things we need to do differently. President Cartwright spoke to the, the intentional outreach to the students. Uh, I think that's really at the heart of really what the message of that data is intended to tell us and help us to understand. Um, you know, we talk at Helios a lot about the COVID spotlight. You know, COVID didn't necessarily create bigger barriers for students to receive and achieve and succeed in post-secondary education, but it very much highlighted 
what have been over decades, the digital divide and other barriers for especially low income first generation students, it highlighted with a bright spotlight those challenges that we all, many of us have been working on for so many years to address. So the opportunity then is taking that spotlight, taking this data and, and, and mobilizing a sense of urgency to do more, to do better, to engage differently, to provide different solutions, um, to speak to what the presidents were suggesting about how do we meet the students where they're at and, and meet the need they have and directly tying to their opportunity to to get that type of job or to move more quickly into the space that's going to make their lives uh, different in a positive way. Um, and so that's, I guess, the point I would make. I mean, we at Helios, once again, appreciate the opportunity to partner with all of you because you're the leaders in this effort. You're the ones that help us to understand where we can engage differently in a manner that's going to directly help the students that we're, we're prioritizing and engaging back into post-secondary education um, and we will create together this sense of urgency to meet those needs. And, and I think that's what this data is telling us and it's telling others. So hopefully we can mobilize more to join us in this work. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We're going to wrap up with one final um, question here. And it's, it's kind of a big one. And that is um, some of the feedback that we've received from our steering committee, as well as a number of different interviews and conversations that we've had with folks that are contributing to this year of reflection often bring up the word trust, that our institutions, not just our institutions of higher learning, but our institutions around uh, all sorts of different ways of us going about life in the United States is really suffering from a vacuum in trust. Some of that is externally focused and some of that uh, could be because, you know, we need to probably improve uh, uh, quite a bit. And that, of course, has precipitated this idea of a... Um, year of reflection. So I would like to close out to, to ask um, each one of you in the room, how do we build back trust in our institutions, especially in higher education from those that might not be thinking that we have their best interests in mind um, and probably from a diversity and inclusion lens? Um, President Rosenberg, uh, if you want to start us off, or, that'd be great. I think we have to uh, understand that we have to do a much better job of building bridges into our respective communities and into our respective leadership groups. We have to understand that uh, we do have a public trust and we do have a fiduciary and that um, we have to do a much better job of explaining how it is we do what we do and what the positive impact of it is. Rather than taking it for granted, and assuming that we have an entitlement to the resources that, that we receive. So I think much greater transparency on one hand uh, about what we do, uh, a better, uh, uh, an ability to listen better. I think many of us think that we're good listeners when we're not uh, really good listeners and um, a, a willingness to work more collaboratively with uh, communities. And by the way, not just communities in the in the glitzy, you know, areas of uh, of our respective um, uh, uh, incredible urban areas, but communities, you know, far and wide. And um, uh, we have that capability, and 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 we have unbelievable talent at our three institutions that is uh, very is ready to get much more engaged but I do believe that we have to do a better job of building those bridges and uh, making sure that it's really a two-way movement of people back and forth rather than just a one-way movement. Absolutely, thank you. Dr. Uh, President Cartwright? You know, President Rosenberg did a, a great job and he actually took some of what I was gonna say, but uh, <laughs> I, think that, I think the biggest things are what he said. Uh, it, it, trust is one of those things that you build up over many years of delivering on what you do. And when you promise something, when you work with external communities, you deliver on what you talk about uh, that you planned on doing uh, with uh, uh, any external communities, it takes a long time to build up that trust, but you can lose it very quickly. Um, and you lose it with small things that, that you may not realize uh, that matter to the people, uh, either externally or internally. And I think it's, that's why the transparency is so important so that 
if, if you don't do, maybe if you couldn't do something, it's clear to people why you may not have done it or why you did something a different way. So that transparency is important. It's accountability that's important. How do you hold uh, everybody at the university accountable and so that everybody understands that what the job is of the president and what they should be doing and that we hold everybody uh, accountable within uh, the institution. I, I think those are the things that are gonna uh, help with rebuilding um, trust. Finally, it's you know really building mechanisms for additional conversations that can add in the, the transparency that's needed. You know, for example, we we created a, a president's uh, student advisory council, and and I have to tell you, that's just a wonderful group uh, of student leaders from around this institution. And they can talk to me about any topic uh, and they bring topics up and we actually learn a tremendous amount from them because they're the ones that are being impacted by the things we're doing every day. And the more we can listen, the more we can uh, listen to what they're saying and what those challenges are. And we start responding to those. So it's one thing to listen, but it's another one to also respond to what you're hearing. And they'll also, you know, and. and people begin to understand that at times you may not be able to do something about a particular problem, or maybe it's not exactly what they may have thought it was and that it's more complex, but they'll start to understand that you do respond when, when you're able to and when it's in the best interests of the bigger, broader uh, community. So I, I think it's about the communications, it's about accountability, it's about transparency, and if you can do all of those things, then you can build the trust that's needed to, to move forward. Absolutely. There's, there's no one more honest than a group of students, right? If you want to know the truth, they're never going to hold back and just tell you what they, they think you want to hear. Um, that's what I love about them. Uh, President Corral, what kind of conversations around trust are you having at USF? Well, uh, Michael, I, I, I think this is actually a brilliant question. And um, the reason, part of the reason why I think it's so brilliant is that I'm trained as an organizational psychologist and I've actually studied trust for about 35 years of my career. <laughs> so I've published uh, numerous pieces on this topic and uh, tried to understand the psychology of, of trust. And so uh, I'll, I'll try to condense my 30 plus years of research into a couple sentences. But, um, you know, one thing we find in the research literature is that trust is built in part when we do the right thing, we're seen as doing the right thing, when in fact there might be uh, incentives for us not to do that, or when we don't have to do the right thing. And and I think this this shows up in the way that we uh, treat our students and the way that we engage with them. And if, if, if we're seen as, as doing the, the, the right thing, for example, uh, there was a lot of decisions we had to make about uh, refunds to our students for, say, housing or, or food service. And there were a number of decisions we made that were not in the university's financial best interest because we were losing revenue. But we still made decisions that uh, were really in the best interest of the students. And we think that was a trust building um, uh, episode for us. It allowed us to, to, to build uh, credibility with them and show that, you know, despite the fact that uh, it created additional financial hardship on us, uh, that we were doing the right thing by our students. And so that was quite powerful. And, and we've continued to try to make those, those kind of uh, decisions. But a lot of the way that, that all of us think about trust it boils down to whether or not we see another person as having a benevolent intentions, trying to protect us, trying to do the right thing ethically, morally. Uh, second, it's whether or not we're um, uh, fully committed to doing the right thing. Sometimes we know the right thing to do, but we're not really wor willing to work hard enough to make sure that we protect someone else. And the last thing is uh, more technical. Uh, do we have the technical ability to, to provide uh, uh, um, safeguards to our students, to our faculty? Of course, that's very relevant now in the, in the era of COVID because there's a lot of science and a lot of technical issues that we have to do to mitigate 
uh, risk. So, uh, so I, I, I just want to commend you for asking such a brilliant question uh, at the end of our conversation here. So thank you for that. <laughs> it's been a long time. Well, I don't think anyone's ever called me brilliant. So, uh, uh, so well, it's a brilliant question. You didn't call so, me brilliant. So Michael, let me chime in then because... Yeah, absolutely. Please. So, so President Corral is talking about how brilliant your question is. Uh, uh, we're going to have to have a conversation how you team me up to answer a question about trust. And I have to follow the president who's written the book about trust and is an expert <laughs> about it. So great. Um, uh, I, I, I would just add uh, uh, two quick points um, and uh, try not to reiterate uh, too much in terms of what the presidents have already said, because I think they've spoken very clearly and eloquently about you know, how you build trust. But when we think about building trust, especially in traditionally underserved communities, and I think some of the points that were made that are important to highlight, uh, really really two things come to mind. And one is this idea of authentic engagement. Uh, and I think that's what each president spoke to uh, in some way, in a meaningful way. You know, the, the, the act of truly listening and hearing and understanding and learning, um, you know, before we're trying to take action or solve problems. Uh, that authentic engagement is critical, I think. Uh, and then secondly, it's also the mindset and approach. You know, it, it's when you, we come at building trust uh, with traditionally underserved communities, beginning by recognizing the inherent value and talent and potential of the community we're engaging um, and, and coming at it from perspective of, we're not here to, to, to save you. We're not here to teach you. We're, we're actually here to back to authentically engage. We're here to, you know, not, not because we believe we inherently have a right to serve you, we're here to understand how we can better engage in a meaningful way to better support, to, to create the path to success. And I think, you know, if we come at it with those two mindsets, um, I think that's how we build trust in the communities. And, and I do know, and I can speak to, uh, I, I know without a doubt that that's the way these the three universities here truly do engage in the communities they serve. And, and again, from a Helios perspective, that's why we're so pleased and honored to be your partners in this work uh, and look forward to continue to do that. Thank you, Paul, President Rosenberg, President Cartwright, President Corral, for your candor and commitment to the year of reflection. So what's next? Throughout this year, we will produce several introspective events. And in the spring, a designated group will leverage the New England Resource Center for Higher Education's cross-institutional and cross-functional evaluation rubric. This framework and assessment tool is comprised of six components of campus climate and structural supports. Each section is designed to highlight a campus's diversity, equity, and inclusion journey. We will conclude the year of reflection with a comprehensive strategic plan of inclusive ongoing engagement and recommendations. In the meantime, please connect with us on social media and engage with us to keep a track of our progress. Thank you for your time and attention.